Hey, good evening, and welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum. And we're on the road to Town Meeting 2020. And as always, Orca is going to cover it with the candidates. We've got some really good shows coming up. We have uh, District 3, which is tonight's show, and it's one of the rare opportunities when one district has two races. And we have a show with uh, Connor and Donna, who are incumbents who are running unopposed. Uh, Ann Watson is going to tell us why she should be mayor again. And then we're going to have a good show with the school board candidates. And then uh, we have Bill Fraser and we have Libby talking about cities and school budgets. So if you want to, you can watch them all. They're all worth watching in, uh, in terms of learning our civics before you head in for town meeting day. But tonight, uh, it's my distinct honor to welcome Bruce Sargent, who's running for the two-year term in District 3. Bruce. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming. Oh, it's my pleasure. All right, Bruce Sargent, what part of District 3 do you live in? I live in uh, on Stribner Street, uh, up behind the radio station. Uh, I've been there for 12 years, and I've really grown to love some of the land that's up there. How There's so? Good, good deer. Uh, Are you speaking her, of deer District 3 or, or right behind and, you? What? Are you speaking of your area or, or District uh, 3? The area behind the house. You know, the, the herd the deer run through. I saw a coyote <laughs> this past spring, and that made me a little nervous because I've got two cats. Um, but it, it's a very wild space. And it's a short drive to here. Uh, and it, it, it's a wonderful place to share uh, Vermont. It, it's unique and a little niche up there, I think. Well, I'm pleased to be there. Now, District 3 has a different character in a lot of ways than District 1 and 2. Can you talk about District 3? Well, I'm very comfortable with District 3 because I grew up in District 3. I grew up in northern Michigan, uh, which is down-to-earth people. Uh, not necessarily the wealthiest people. We had one wealthy kid in my class, and he, he didn't really fit in. He, he ended up going to uh, a private school, uh, God bless him, and uh, he, he went on to the military and became very famous for uh, his work in Vietnam. He, he was awarded medals for it. So I'm proud of him, but it was very unusual to have money in northern Michigan. And my Where in northern Michigan? It was Marquette. It was, uh, <laughs> it was the grand city of the north. Uh, I felt myself a city slicker, and my town population was 12,000, uh, counting uh, maybe 2,000 of the prison population that was there. It wasn't very big. So it's very similar to Montpelier in terms of, of, of ethic uh, and feelings. Different in that there are some wealthy places in Montpelier. Uh, and my district is also has some of the, the wealthiest uh, on Park Street. It's beautiful. So it's an interesting combination. I did knock on <laughs> the, the brother, so the, the, no, the father's door at the church looking for signatures. <laughs> and the man says, we don't vote. Uh, and, and he said, but I'll give you a blessing. So I was struggling with uh, being so new to politics, and I said, yeah, and all of a sudden things started to be magical, you know, things started to turn up. I, I couldn't really um, uh, solicit people in the, the senior center, for, even though they're many of my friends, it's against the rules. And a person that I especially wanted on, on my, my signature list turned up at the co-op. I've never seen her before, and I was there, she was there, I happened to have my clipboard, so she signed, signed my, my signatures, and uh, her signature on, on, added to the list. She volunteered to take uh, a blank sheet and to get uh, people to fill it in. Uh, Boy, that's a blessing. <laughs> but, but I said, I sent it for her, and then but I called her, I said, no, I have an agreement that I won't uh, campaign in the center. And that would be breaking the agreement. And to be impeccable, I'm going to ask you not to do that. So that's another thing. I'm a, I'm a former Boy Scout, Eagle Scout, Order of the Arrow Vigil member, which is about the highest in that honorary group you can get. So I value my integrity deeply, and I have since high school, and it's, it's, I still do. Um, and so that's one of the things that I think 
could help City Hall because my experience, so? my experience with them has been that a lot of times decisions are made uh, without due process and they're made for political convenience and I'm uncomfortable with that. I, 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 I didn't like can, that can experience. Can you give me an example or two of, of something well, that didn't have due process? Okay. We had an experience with the neighbor shifting the water course and damaging Maggie's property, who was my friend, where I stay. And there were things like Mr. McCardle said. Now you're speaking of our former public yeah, the director of Public Works, Tom McCarthy. That's right. And he said, um, there's no erosion being caused by this. And I go out and measure it at three and a half feet. And then he said, I visited and I saw no erosion. And it was like Alice in Wonderland. It was things that I felt weren't true. And we've been having a three-year conversation about this, and we're still having it. I just wrote a letter today. Uh, uh, pointing up some of this, um, and it's turned into a horrendous difficulty. Uh, the boundary was not really settled, by, in my mind, by the resurvey that was done there. And the more we got into it, and today, just recently, I began to really realize that a lot of it looks like a scam of an elderly person to me. Um, they got Maggie to agree to a shrinking of her rights of the easement from 396 to 340 feet. And it happened to be because I found a map uh, that said it, the street was accepted at 340 feet. Nobody knew that before I found the map. But I'm an honest man, and even though it was against what I was, my goals were, I made sure that was presented uh, to City Hall because it was a fact. So the resurvey went through at 340, and Maggie was in agreement with a compromise. She lost 56 feet of, of, of land along the, what her deed said was hers to use. Um, and then a year later, the rest of it uh, was deemed um, a park, a trail. She loses her easement in a park or a trail. She said, I would have appealed the decision if I'd known that. What was the evidence of a park or a trail being there? It was the surveyor's plat. In the little square describing the, that little parcel, it was filled with writing and numbers, and it said fourth class city uh, highway in that little square. But it didn't have the two lines for easement. So this is, this is a little bit like fine print. This is beyond fine print. It's expecting you to look at the, a map that doesn't have those lines on it and recognize it and therefore say, oh, it's a trail. Would, would this be an issue that would go before environmental court? Would, would it be an issue that what? Uh, that would be appealed before environmental court in Vermont? Well, that's a good question. We've, we did appeal uh, in, to the, the, the nat natural resources. And they said that it, it, it was so small, this, the water course, even though it's hugely damaged, it's caused my friend $100,000 in damage. And plus the loss of that easement is 50, uh, roughly 50000 25 for the 340 and another twenty four. So the surprise, oh, is, <laughs> this is not really uh, a fourth class highway. This agree, the, um, Research race said very clearly that this piece was a fourth class uh, city highway. And then it's defined as a trail, and Mr. Gillies, who was the attorney, has written that, that a trail is no way a highway. It's a fifth class category. So there's, there's, there's games with words going on here, and if, if, frankly, it all benefits the neighbor. The, what? Ben, the ben, he gets he gets what Maggie loses the ben, uh, the neighbor gain. In terms of counsel, did you speak with Ashley Hill or, or with Glenn? We did. She's very busy and she was very ill. 
we've, and we've talked to Glenn, and he agreed with us about this at the beginning, and, but he hasn't been able to change uh, Bill Fraser's mind at all. Now, I, this isn't the most important thing of why I came here. Well, well, this is, I, want, I want to finish this, this, on this. this. This was a precipitating event in my life. How would you have dealt with this different than Glenn dealt with it? Yeah, how would I done? Yeah, if you were on council and someone were to present this situation to you, as a representative of District 3, now Ashley was ill, okay, so take question. Ashley out. But how would, how would you have approached it differently than Glenn did? I would have liked more detail and more understanding to, to make a decision. And when I had that decision and I was very clear, I would have told Bill Fraser that I'm the boss, I'm the decision maker, not you. And that it is not a trail, it is a fourth class highway, and some of the things that are happening are really unlawful. I, th I would have done that. And I've got the courage to stand up for that kind of position. The position that I'm the only one and everybody else uh, will disagree and make the argument. Now, it doesn't mean I'm always right. I'm always willing to listen to lawful descriptions, but I've not really got that from City Hall. They've not presented, they just repeated the thesis. It's a trail without really giving me laws about why it's a trail. Bruce, when did you come to Montpelier? What? When did you arrive in Montpelier? Twelve years ago. Twelve years. What was Montpelier? Nothing, nothing of it like this was happening yet. What, what was Montpelier like 12 years ago to you? I, a, a different, that's different than the Montpelier of today. I was so happy to get to Vermont. I'd lived in Massachusetts, Boston area all my life. And on holidays, I'd go up to New Hampshire or Vermont. And I didn't really want to be living in an urban environment, but that's, that's the place I could, was earning my living. I was a school teacher. Um, and I ended up with my own school in Salem that I, I founded, the Phoenix School of Salem. It's still there. I, I've left it about 15 years ago. Uh, both my wife and I and her friend started Barbara McFall. And when our marriage ended, I had to leave the school as well as the marriage. So that was, that was a precipitating event there. So I've been off on a life of adventure since then. Um, probably a peak experience of that was helping John Irving and Jan Ir uh, Irving begin their, their school in Manchester Center. I was one of the founding teachers. That's not the, the author, John Irving. Yeah, John Irving. Yeah, so, so we at staff dinners at his house. And he, he is such a wonderful man. We're, we're full of writing, and I, I will, pardon me, but always wanted to be a writer. I'm, I'm in the middle of beginning a, a novel for the last few years. Uh, but it was fun talking to John. He had the most incredible imagination. We had a, a shadow puppet theater come, and he, it was delivered, and he delivered a child there. And he looked at it, and he waxed eloquently for about 15 minutes on the insulation that was put on the back to hold the sticks of the shadow puppet about how it looked like cheese. And I, I've never heard a discourse like that. And I said, that's the kind of mind you have to, to, to need to have to create fiction. It was just an unbelievable moment. The Mount Pelier of 12 years ago. Yeah. It, it was, what did that strike you like when you first arrived as a resident of the town, not as a visitor? Uh, I loved the Langdon Street Cafe at the time. I loved the people that there. I loved the music. They were, now that's where Sweet Melissa's is now. Is it, now Sweet Melissa's right. now, yeah. And uh, it was Langdon Street Cafe. You asked me 12 years ago. <laughs> I put my mind back there. And I think that it was the musicians that were multi-generational that touched me. That this was a place where the generations weren't separate. Um, and that is so profound. Uh, the problem with education, the industrial setting for it, where all the kids are at the same age, there's a whole lot of kids are taught they're not leaders because they're not leaders in this little small group. If they're in uh, mixed ages, they become leaders because they're helping the younger kids. And so we deny people their experience with their leadership ability by the way we structure only 
10-year-olds are going to be going to this class right now, and if you're 9-year-old or 12, you're not going to be in it. So that it, it, it's very unconscious, but it builds from there. So that's what touched me. Um, I think I had the good fortune when I started teaching. I taught at the Fairwoody Street School in Cambridge, which was a very noted school at the time. It still is, I think. And it was uh, on the British model of mixed ages, family grouping. And that came out of World War II when they moved out of London. They had 100 kids in a class. What are they going to do? Well, put them with their brothers and sis older sisters, and they'll teach them. So, and that worked. That worked. They could have a class of 100 with one teacher and organize it so education was going forward. Uh, that was something that was happened in the 70s. I happened to have the good luck of having a Abby Hoffman's kids in my class. So, Abby Hoffman of Abby Hoffman yeah, and Jerry it, it Rubin. Noted and, Abby Hoffman. Was Abby Hoffman on the run at that point, or was this before? Abby that? Hoffman was never really there. Sheila was there. Abby came and said, "You promised that you would pay the tuition that he missed the previous year and get the next one." Well, he, he had problems, and he didn't do either one. But Sheila and those two kids, and Abby as kind of a catalyst. They were some of the most wonderful kids I taught at mine. Very sensitive, very kindly, and lovely. Uh, so I, I was happy to know the kids, and I was happy to see the charisma that Abby had. I was totally convinced we were going to get paid. <laughs> now, what year would this have been? Oh, gosh. It had to be in the 70s. I can't, I, at 77, I can't nail it down for you. <laughs> I, this is something that's very unique. Uh, we have a unique candidacy here. Uh, Bruce wants to read several of his poems to define himself. I, I think I want to read them uh, because I think it reveals myself. Uh, when I first came to Montpelier, I was pretty isolated from politics. And National been, politics or local politics? Everything. I wanted nothing to do with it since the Kennedy assassination, which, which did a good job of breaking my heart. And then that, as that unfolded, um, there's some very strange things happen around the, the, the truth of that. And we're still working on that as a nation. We need a, a resolution to that which, that we haven't had. So when I got here, I, there was a reference. It was that William Pepper's An Act of State, The Execution of Martin Luther King, which is in the collection at, at Kellogg Harbor. However, I read that, and I was so moved that I, I wanted to write this poem, which hung on the city hall last year. During, uh, during, the, poet, during poet, the poetry, poetry month? Yeah. On December 8, 1999, in a civil trial in Memphis, Tennessee, four weeks after hearing testimony from more than 70 witnesses, 12 jurors, in less than an hour, reached a unanimous verdict finding the U.S. government guilty of the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King. The U.S. government was required to pay damages to King family for Martin's wrongful death, which the government did without pursuing an appeal. Ask yourself why. You knew, never knew this fact of American history until now when I wrote it, more than 16 years later. I read this for Reuben Jackson, who was a noted uh, African-American poet in the area. He said, the black community knew this. The white community That's doesn't. Reuben Jackson, who used to have the show on, um, on VPR. Yes. Yeah. Right. So that, that's, uh, it, it, it's a sadness that that this has been buried. It's a sadness that what actually kills JFK has been buried. Uh, it takes very skillful propaganda to hide it. And my government is more than capable of doing that. But that lack of integrity uh, is very destructive to ordinary life and to getting things done. And we end up with um, uh, a country that you, it, you can't even elect a Bernie uh, Sanders. We have elected a Bernie Sanders over and over and over. 
the vice presidential run when oh. he clearly won it statistically, 77 billion to one, if that's a false statement. He won that election in 2016, and it was stolen from him. Now, I, th I thought about bringing this up as I was a representative. I thought about bringing it up at the uh, Vermont con con uh, Convention. I had a proposal to, that uh, that would change some of this and vacate elections that were false. And I knew that it would just rip the place apart. So I withdrew it. And I brought it to the platform committee. Which platform committee? Democratic Party platform committee. It was accepted there. Um, people weren't ready to think about what, what had happened uh, in terms of Bernie being a, a denied uh, the, the, uh, the nomination. So it was too much for people to Do think. you believe that that corruption of spirit has happened on the state level in Vermont or, or on the local level? Statistically, it did. Statistically, it did. The only state that was 100% okay with the results was Oklahoma. And I have to say in Vermont, Vermont wasn't as bad as 90% certain. Vermont was only 50, 50% that were, and it's, I could bring now that information to John Connors, and I, I don't know what, what, he, what he did with it. I think they probably did do study because the next year there was uh, anti-hacking uh, things that was I'm all, because that election can be hacked from a car outside of the polling area by radio. And that has to Which be election? What? Which election can be hacked? Any election can be, be manipulated with, with the count by a car and a radio. Uh, and that, that was done in, we have 9,000 voting districts in the U.S. and there's a lot of work that has to be done to make sure that there are all as honest as Vermont and as honest as Oregon. So um, you believe that when we go into City Hall and we mark our ballots and we put them in the machine? Those are paper ballots and they can be um, checked. The, when, when there was a, a, a one vote difference? Mm -hmm. That was Ashley. <laughs> that was that Ashley was, and Francis. Yeah, uh, I always Francis. regretted not working harder for her. I was ashamed of myself. If she deserved one more vote, and I did, should have got it for her. Um, but I'm losing my thread. Forgive me. Bruce, what's your other poem that you brought? Okay. Um, you had two. I think it all wound up in, in, uh, in politics. Uh, and get upset with it. Um, but, that's but you're a, making the positive step to actually put your integrity onto city council. Well, I, to, uh, you know, I, I, that's the most valuable thing I have. I tell people I don't have a lot of money, but I have integrity. And I won't give it up for any price. So when somebody sells me something and they don't charge me fully, I said, you didn't charge me fully for this. The price on the counter said, and, and I'll do it the opposite, too. I'm honest about it. I don't try to benefit. So the next poem is more about the world divides roughly into people behaving to overcome trauma. And I had a very serious trauma when I was young, and it took me a lifetime to overcome it. And that's the experience of most people. And then there's a miracle that's happening with my partner's infant. He has been so lovingly and cared for, burst in water, a father that loves him spectacularly, that he operates from joy and pleasure. Now, you can see this in people's eyes. When people are in joy and pleasure, their pupils go to a pinpoint, like a cat purring. And when they're working from trauma, the pupils are bigger. This little fellow is operating entirely from the parasympathetic nervous system. And he's just delighted with life, and he has no reason not to be. Now, that, that's a tremendous job of work. We could revolutionize a, a lot of what's wrong with the world 
if we could raise children like that. So that's happening in my family, and not because of me, but because of Ezra and my partner uh, Maggie's uh, son and his beautiful way of living that came from her. Uh, so the next point, take, take I'm phone. talking about love. Please, it, is, please. it isn't about anger or frustration. On an autumn walk today, I chanced to see a sway of purple flowers along the way and promised myself upon return with errand done, I'd pick each bloom for my darling one. When I came back, I saw every purple, purple flower held to be and bound to some higher law than romantic love. Let go my need and let them be. And I write these words down nonetheless to you, my darling, will know and bless. This is as splendid as purple flowers of autumn. My love, words of a bunch, poem, parable, a bower of rhyme, it, that you might cherish this to the end of time, to your final day, and you might recall and say, I was loved anyway, without bouquet. That's lovely. Thank you. Bruce, I have a question. Sure. I, I have a couple of them that I ask <laughs> every year. And these, uh, for people who are watching this and have watched this before, they're waiting for this question. Is Montpelier a city or a town? Is what? Is Montpelier a city or a town? Which do you consider it? Well, it's legally a city, and right, I, but, but I confuse the word I call a town, you know, just, and I'm not sure what the legal distinction is, just, and I should know. But sociologically, do you consider it a small city or a town? I think of it as a town. You know, the, I know so many people here in Plainfield, they come and, and you know, the fire on ice with families and kids and adults, the inner general. I, it, it's more of a town feeling than a city. A city is anonymous. You could do bad things and nobody knows. And in Vermont, if you do bad things, your neighbor knows. And, there's a and saying, your neighbor knows their neighbor. <laughs> and there's a saying that comes from the Mayans and, and about their, their, it reminds me of Vermont. The Mayans say that they know the color of the pee before you pee it, and they have an opinion about it. So Vermonters are that way. They know some bad things about you before you do them, and they have an opinion about it. You know? well, <laughs> what are the town's strengths? What are Montpelier's strengths? I think it's, it, in its intergenerational families, uh, uh, and I think that uh, one of the strengths is its council and its mayor. I think they have, their, so? they have their heart in the right place. Uh, I wish they were stronger. Did stronger in what sense? What's that? Stronger in what sense? I wish they were not so committed to to uh, making it easy because things aren't easy, uh, from what I can see. Uh, I don't, I, you know, it's a difficult issue to bring up, but um, I've heard of of uh, bribes being solicited. In on the local level? In this town, on the local level. I've heard of it. That's hearsay. It's not evidence. And when I mentioned that I'm very aggressively interested in putting in another uh, ethics statement that would make it more difficult and risky for people to solicit bribes, I've actually had a man come to me and admit to a bribe, and won't nail it down, but well over $100,000. That said, must have been shocking to you. It was shocking to me. And it did, it, I, and you know, it was a, please don't tell me this. I don't want to know this. But it was, it was, um, it was, I have to weigh it. That, was it a believable source? Well, it's believable enough for me to want to act on defeating that kind of thing. And what I think Montpelier needs is a stronger ethics statement, one with teeth in it, one that re requires people to respond to a ethics officer if they become aware of this sort of thing, and 
is a serious thing that can be done that I want to bring. So that's one, I'm here to make a change if I do, if, if I were elected. That's one of the things I like to do. This is uh, fighting small town corruption. Now, if it exists, and I think it probably does, on a very, very small, you know, 2%, but it's enormous increase on taxes for, for getting Well, I think the done. subtitle is more interesting in its own way, a calm, Obtaining accountability, transparency, and what's the third? An oversight. <laughs> you're right. You should be my teacher. <laughs> no, 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 please. <laughs> but you're right. You know, I, I should have gone into that, that and that's what that does. It's what, it's, it was developed at Columbia University, and I, I think people in the council... So that would be your mission, is to work on accountability, oversight, and transparency? Exactly. And you had people roll up their sleeves. Just sleep. When we were joking at the beginning, you know, it was just two other people are, are voting, and I said, I don't know them. They may be better off than I am in getting this done. If, in, you know, I'm going to make a decision about who I'm going to vote for myself or the other two people, and it's not necessarily me. So I don't necessarily think that I'm the most likely person to get some of this done. If I but am, those are your aspirations. But if I am, I'm going to go after it. And I'll, I, at the age of 77, you will get the best I can out of me, and I'll do the very best I can to protect people from this kind of behavior. You have to make it high risk, and I don't think it's high risk enough. Bruce, um, you've been in town for 12 years. There's been a lot of counselors on our city council. We've had a number of mayors over 12 years. Is there somebody who stands out in your mind, not so much perhaps on the present council, perhaps on past councils, as a role model for you, that well, you I would think, as, aspire towards their two, approach? I think there's two role models for me. One I met in gathering signatures, and he's known as Mr. Montpelier, and that's Mr. Sheridan. Jim Sheridan, a long yeah, time James, District yeah. 3. And uh, we had a long discussion, he, and I could see he was still interested in government, and I, and I said, if I were elected, I'd really like your help, and he agreed to help me on that. The other person that stands out for me is Glenn Hutchinson. Um, uh, present District 3, who's yes, leaving the council. I think it's, a, it's one of the reasons I ran, because he stepped down. Uh, I think his background with the friends and counseling is incredible, an incredible value. And I've asked Glenn if I should happen to be elected, and I'm, that's not certain in, <laughs> in my mind, that if, if uh, to help me take on that responsibility that he has done so well. He met with people in, at Piquitos on a regular basis, once a week, Thursday exactly. in the morning. As uh, Ann Watson, our mayor, has hours now where you can meet the mayor. Yeah, and I love the Irish music that happens there <laughs> coming from, but Glenn is also from the Boston area. He's a wonderful artist. Uh, he's very sensitive. We've had talks about Boston well belong, beyond what we were talking about in Montpelier. And I admire him for his ability to do what he's done. If I could do half the job he could do, I'd be proud of it because he's, he's very special. Now, I would be remiss, and I don't know whether our producer can shoot in. Can you move your scarf? You're wearing a badge. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, I would be remiss if I if I didn't ask what is that badge that you're wearing? Could you tell us what it is? It, it's just supporting workers at the co-op. Um, I, I come from a working class family. And I told you about my father taking nine years to get his degree. My grandfather mined coal in uh, Great Britain at the age of 13. By 19, he had his master of his craft. And if he stayed in that job, he was going to die within a decade from black lung. So he and his brothers came to this country. One came to Vermont to, to mine marble, and the other one to... Uh, did he live in Barrie? What? Did, he, uh, did the one who was mining live in Barrie? He, he may have. I haven't tracked it down okay. yet. But he, I think he might have been down Danby, where the marble okay. is, too, as well. And uh, the other one moved to Colorado to mine copper. And my grandfather went to northern Michigan to mine iron ore for making cars. It was shipped down through the Great Lakes. He went to work in the dark. He worked a 12 hour shift in the dark. And he walked home in the dark. He saw the sun on Sunday. Anytime I want to complain about my workload, 
I just have to think of my grandpa that got me. So you're supporting the workers at the co-op? Yeah, I, I support workers, and I'm disappointed that, the, that they were more aggressive uh, in the Democratic election in 2016 in supporting workers. Absolutely. Uh, that, that, you know, the, the minimum wage at 15, absolutely. That's just the beginning. And there's so many things that we could do if we stop having wars. We, we've had this incredible 15-year war, which is great for people to make tanks and weapons, and that keeps the economy going on that level. But it's not great for the kids that are, have to join the military because it's an economic draft. We don't have a draft in them. They, they have nowhere else to go. And God bless them. Uh, I have friends in northern Michigan that, that their, the whole family has gone, gone, gone into the armed services. It's a hard way to get able to get your college degree. Bruce, um, you're running for office. I merely have this television show. But I thank you for, for spreading your integrity, trying to yeah. establish your integrity in our town yeah. to cure the ills that you see. Thank you. And I thank you for coming. And I'd like to speak with you. And that deals with town meeting day that's coming in early March. Uh, I hope that you'll watch all of these shows, including the show on the city budget and the school budget, and all the candidate shows, as well as the one that Ann will present her case to remain our mayor. And I certainly hope that you'll come out and vote and encourage your family and friends to come out and vote. That's the bedrock of our democracy, is participation by those of us who are watching this show and those of us who are producing this show. Thank you very much for watching.